Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. It's um, fabulous to be here back in Hawaii after being away for a little while. So I want to take us to Japan. In 2008, in the fall of 2008, I lived in Japan in that building. And um, I was a corporate and project finance lawyer during one of the most spectacular times in our, in our global history. You might recall the fall of 2008. That was the year that we elected our first black president in this country, a man from Hawaii, as it so happens. And the world fell apart. So in Japan, I had the opportunity to work with some of the smartest attorneys in the world, bankruptcy, finance attorneys, as we all struggled collectively to save a financial system that was fundamentally broken. I also witnessed our federal government here in the United States orchestrate one of the most monumental wealth transfers in history, where trillions of dollars flowed from taxpayers to international financial institutions deemed too big to fail. And while I was in Japan, it dawned on me that we had this phenomenal opportunity to reshape the world, to change our financial system, which was inherently unjust, rife with risk, and centralized power. But we didn't do that. It probably comes as no surprise that I shortly, uh, shortly thereafter, after 2008, I left the corporate world and landed in the heart of the Mexican forest. I'm a little extreme in that way. <laughs> so I landed in this place uh, called El Bosque, and um, there I was really curious about the ways that we could actually um, become more sustainable, the, the ways that we could model sustainability at a small scale. Of course, in El Bosque, I became more interested um, than I already was in energy. I was, a, as I mentioned, a project finance lawyer, so I helped to build large uh, power plants when I was a lawyer, a practicing lawyer. Um, but in El Bosque, we were looking at um, small and scalable, small scale um, solutions to, to questions of energy. Um, I learned a lot in Mexico, but it still didn't seem to be enough for me. It still didn't um, seem to show exactly how we could model equitable solutions to sustainability that also created pathways for prosperity. So some of you may recognize this. This is Molokai. Um, three years ago, I landed here in Hawaii as a professor at the University of Hawaii School of Law, and I quickly learned a lot of things. I learned that here in Hawaii, we pay three times the national average for electricity. We have the highest rooftop solar penetration in the country. One in six, uh, around one in six of our um, electricity customers here have a rooftop solar unit, which is ex extraordinary. And we also have a, a public utilities commission that is highly motivated to, to help the, the utility to develop a sustainable business plan to advance the state's renewable energy goals. And as you know, as you've heard several times today, the renewable energy goals in the state are remarkable. 100% renewable energy by 2045. So again, I landed here in Hawaii three years ago, and all of these things were sort of bubbling in the surface and bu bubbling um, in the ether. And I thought, OK, here is one place where I can finally figure out how we get to that equitable and sustainable world that creates pathways for prosperity. I thought, of course, we'd be modeling that here in the state, but I was wrong. Of course, there have been some bright spots along the way. The same year that the 100% RPS was passed by the legislature, we saw a community-based renewable energy bill also passed and signed into law by the governor. Um, unfortunately, that bill has not yet got, gotten off the ground, and its goal was essentially to allow those who had been excluded from our remarkable solar revolution to participate in solar generation. And primarily, that looks like sharing in an off-site solar project if you live in an apartment building or a high-rise. But again, um, that has not yet gotten off the ground. And there, it looks like we may eventually see some sort of community-based renewable energy here in Hawaii. Um, 
The other issue with uh, the community-based renewable energy program is that it doesn't necessarily target those communities um, that pay the highest and a disproportionately high portion of their income for their electricity. So again, um, I was sort of struggling with, with the question of whether Hawaii could be a, a true model for charting a just and sustainable pathway that creates prosperity. And we have a strong history here in the state. Um, as HECO's materials laud, um, we were one of the first palaces in the world to be lit by electric power, or light that was um, fueled by electric power. So there's a history of innovation here in the state, and innovation is really in the, in the fabric of this place. So in the last three years, I've had the pleasure of speaking with many of you in this room about energy issues in the state, trying to understand and wrap my arms around what exactly is happening here in Hawaii. And three inquiries have sort of risen to the surface with respect to the state's energy transition. The first question is, how should renewable energy be produced? The second, how should energy be distributed? Microgrids, should we remain um, with the centralized power system that we have been relying on? And then third, who should own it? And of course, we all witnessed the epic uh, merger battle that happened last year, um, the year before, which, which consumed many people's, or the attention of, of many folks. But so, these three questions are typically treated as technical questions, right? So what kind of technology do we need? How many batteries can we use? What kind of power projects can we put in the ground to, to answer um, all of these questions and to get us to our 100% renewable energy goal? But these questions fundamentally implicate issues of distribution of wealth, distribution of power, and justice. But in my conversations with literally hundreds of people around the state, including regulators, including policymakers, legislators, my colleagues at the University of Hawaii School of Law, my colleagues at the, at the University of Hawaii in general, um, the consumer advocate, nonprofit leaders, executives at our utility, it became clear to me that justice and the true implications of these three questions was simply not on the table. And so, over the last three years, I've begun to develop a framework for bringing to the surface the issues of justice and the redistribution of wealth, which is fundamental to this energy transition, but simply not on the surface. Energy justice should inform every aspect of policy and every aspect of this renewable energy transition. But there's a real question about what it is. I mean, I founded the Energy Justice Program, but I still don't know what energy justice is. Um, what I do know, though, is that energy policy should be informed by the principles of climate justice. Climate justice provides that the most vulnerable residents in the state, and those who will be most impacted by the effects of climate change, should be rendered more resilient with the energy development that Comes into, um, comes into play here in our energy transition. I also know that energy justice should incorporate the principles of environmental justice. We've already heard that word once today. But environmental justice requires that those who have historically borne, disproportionately borne the burdens of energy development, dirty development, other types of environmentally harmful um, development, should not be rendered more vulnerable and disproportionately bear the burden of renewable energy development in this energy transition. Energy policies must take this into account if they are to be equitable and just. Third, energy democracy should be a core component of any energy policy that we begin to think about in this energy transition. And what is energy democracy? Well, for one, it means educating communities about energy policy issues. Yes, that is hard. My students know this. It's hard work translating energy policy into something that everyday citizens can understand. 
but energy, energy justice requires it, and it is possible. And fourth, perhaps even harder than the energy democracy piece, is the economic justice aspect of energy, of energy justice. So economic justice is fascinating because it also means that we have to think about the ways in which communities will be impacted by renewable energy development and offer them opportunities to participate economically in projects and begin to think about ways that they might be able to generate their own electricity. We've seen that in the proliferation of renewable energy on rooftops here. But with energy justice, we're thinking about ways communities can themselves participate in the generation of electricity. And here in Hawaii, we have about one in seven residents who is in poverty. And so the question of economic justice is a real one and should be incorporated into energy policy. So we sit at a crossroads here in Hawaii. We're at an energy crossroads. One road that we could possibly take to chart our renewable energy future is the traditional road, where the same interests who have been participating in the energy policy conversation for decades sit behind closed doors and craft policies that exclude those who have been marginalized historically in the state. We could take that traditional pathway, or we could take the energy justice pathway. The energy justice pathway is indeed harder. It is absolutely harder. But the cool thing about energy justice and that pathway is that it will make us all more resilient in the face of climate change it will empower families um, in ways that they have never seen because they've been struggling to make ends meet due to electricity, due to their electricity costs. And it will make the state stronger. Energy justice has that power, and it's our moral imperative to take that road. Thank you. Mm -hmm.